I'll be honest, uh, I recorded a video the other day, and it was like half an hour long, uh, to talk about this, and it was so disjointed, and I rambled to such a degree that I actually didn't address anything I wanted to talk about. Um, essentially, that last video boiled down to, did you know that you can make role-playing games other than medieval fantasy? You can make steampunk games, and you can even use other cultures, like Asian cultures or South American cultures, in order to model your games. So, it was really stupid. Anyway, um, I, have, I have yet to uh, solidify, yet to set in stone anything in particular about Animal Planet. Um, I'm designing it backwards, as we know. I've, deci I've decided these are the races that exist. And I will go backwards and create a world around them, kind of to justify them. As the races exist, you could pretty much do anything you wanted with them. Um, other than some of the skills and like the fact that Kalupin are proficient with great swords. There's nothing that would stop you from even doing like a science fiction kind of setting with them. But that's not what I want to do. Um, when I was... I guess I'll share... Uh, how do I want to do it? Some of my thoughts were I didn't want a standard D&D-ish kind of world. I don't want to get too far from a standard D&D-ish kind of world, but I don't want to have it just be, you know, here's the... <laughs> it's the same game that we always play, guys. It's just Pathfinder, but it, you have different races instead. I want something a little bit more meaningful than that. Um... So here's a couple random thoughts that occurred to me while I was driving two weeks ago or so when Animal Planet, before I had, uh, I think I had only made up Kalupins and Leopards at the time. I hadn't created the other races yet. But <clears throat> the very first thought that came to mind was half-breeds. Now I'm going to share, it's going to take me a couple minutes to explain what went through my head in a minute while driving. But the issue of half-breeds immediately came up. You have this world, and I had specifically told myself, here's one of the things I set in stone, I didn't want all of the races to be segregated into their own section. I wanted them to be very much mixed together. So you'd have all of these cities and communities, and while they wouldn't contain every race necessarily, they're going to contain multiple races. Just like a regular D&D campaign world is going to have, you know, even in the human town, especially nowadays, you're going to find plenty of dwarves and elves and halflings and gnomes and half-orcs and what have yous. Um, and it's those half-orcs and half-elves that bring up the issue of the half-races. Um, one of the other main points that I made in the racial video is that I didn't want to be beholden to the idea of the animals, but I certainly wanted to draw inspiration from and not really conflict with uh, the, uh, the idea of the animals. So, for example, one of the things I shared and actually came up in the comments on the races video was the idea of giving the Muri, the mouse people, um, a sort of tinker engineering mechanical aspect to them. So, if you needed, you know, all these kinds of clockwork mechanisms in the higher tech level uh, equipment it's going to be probably be involved with mice and rats to some degree, because that would be their shtick. Uh, that does not violate anything that you already think of when you think of mice and rats, but neither when you think of mice and rats is there anything that immediately says, oh yes, obviously they're going to be the guys that make, you know, inventions and contraptions. That's not something that, you know, mice do. Anyway... The thought was half-breeds, and the first thought that comes into my mind is, absolutely not. Nobody's going to be breeding some half Kaloop and half ave weirdo creature with, you know, like a beagle with a beak or something like that. Um, so that was off the table. But that doesn't mean that these interspecial, uh, I'm going to say interracial, but know that I mean D&D &D race, these interracial relationships are obviously going to exist to some degree. Um, my idea would be to keep them very rare so that they actually mean something when they come up and you're not constantly walking around with all of the, uh, you know, different couples, especially because none of them are, uh, you can't crossbreed any of the different races together. So every single one of those couples would be completely unable to do any breeding. 
Um, it does occur to me right now that that actually might be a, a benefit to the setting because most of these animals that they're based on tend to have a lot of children at once. They're not like humans where they have one or maybe two. Um, these are dogs and cat. Well, I keep saying cats. I'll, I'll continue to say cats. Um, dogs and birds and rats. They tend to have multiple children. Um, and by multiple, I mean like half a dozen to a dozen or so. So it could explain why the world is not overrun with them. But that could also be explained by just saying that they don't have that many kids. You know, just make it closer to a, uh, a human ideal. Maybe twins and triplets are a little more common. But all right. So getting back to the main point here. The uh, ideal was there would be these interracial couples um, and you have to immediately think, OK, they can't breed with each other. How is society? How is the world view informed towards it? And one of the thoughts would be uh, obviously that it's a bad thing. Um, and then the other thought would be it's a good thing. Now, where does the it's a good thing come from? Well, it could be that, especially when you mire it in with the idea of animals and the fact that you have that animalistic drive towards procreation and the continuation of the race. Oh, by the way, it's been six and a half minutes. I'll talk about the uh, the picture in a minute. Uh, well, before the end of the video. Uh, you have all of these ideas that kind of come together that there would be this drive where you would have to have kids. And then you have this uh, interracial couple that's completely unable to. And you could maybe see that there's an idea that that's sort of a more pure form of love because it's not being uh, burdened by the, the drive to procreate that these animals would have. Um, I kind of want to steer away from all of that, however, because it, it draws an easy analogy into the game world that I don't feel like dealing with. And uh, so I quickly uh, kind of abandoned the idea here. The biggest part is in the game world, I figure that it's going to be rare and it's going to be that there's no crossbreeding and then just leave it at that. Um, the Whether and how people perceive it in the game world is uh, not going to be set by like a global idea of how it works, particularly because we get to the next section. Um, it was while I was it was while I was thinking of I mean literally while I was thinking about Animal Planet that I very first heard uh, Fallout Boy's new single "My Songs Know What You Did in the Dark." Now I'm very very bad at picking out what song lyrics actually say. I can usually get the chorus because it's repeated and it's usually a little bit clearer than the regular lyrics. So I knew that it said my, I knew it said my somethings know what you did in the dark. I didn't quite grasp that it was songs, but I certainly heard light them up. Um, that's very plain and repetitive and clear. So the very first time I heard that song, I imagined a sort of uh, animalistic cult amongst the races. Um, I had... I think earlier in the day, not while the song came on, but earlier I had been thinking about religion and how I was going to handle clerics and what have you in the game. But what I had here was this idea. They had mentioned it was very dark, um, picking out lyrics from the song, and then they were going to light it up. And so I just saw, like, on a, in the middle of the night, on a night of the new moon, so it's pitch black, well, basically pitch black outside, only starlight to light your way, uh, no sun, no moon. These there would be these animal cultists and they're all wearing their hoods and their robes and they're marching out into the forest and each of them is bringing logs and other things with them to burn. Maybe if uh, I didn't come up with this at the time, but maybe they bring offerings um, to their animalistic spirits and what have you. But they talk about how dark it is and then they say that they're going to light it up. And then I imagine them literally lighting this gigantic bonfire in the forest such that it's, you know, bright like the daytime now. And then um, the song definitely has a sort of angry, vengeful tone to it, that it's kind of uh, malicious. And so I then imagine that they headed into town, each of them carrying parts, uh, you know, something lit from this bonfire and kind of just setting fire to things and causing destruction and what have you. And uh, so the idea there that it the idea that that implied was there would be some sort of um, kind of church structure 
let's just pretend like coming from a medieval fantasy kind of thing there would be this monolithic like catholic church institution throughout the the setting and there would then be these kind of pagan animalists who think that they need to go back to a more you know a less uh controlled and neutered if you will stance so this church keeps preaching you know take care of everybody and you have to protect the weak and the the last among you will be first and so now you have this like you know you're thinking animals you're thinking the alpha dog kind of moment where it's like i'm big i'm strong i should be right just because i have the might to be right and so you would see them you know in the middle of the night with these bonfires coming out and setting fire to things in town like setting fire to the church and uh, other structures of importance it ties back into my chaos cultists from trocare i'm pretty sure i mentioned that in some videos um but the idea of just you know these cults that exist and cause chaos and have these weird religious beliefs on top of it now i say weird i just mean different um everything is kind of twisted the faces of fear i know i did videos on the faces of fear that's one of the chaos cults they have weird beliefs about things so that came to mind. Now, later on, when I listened to the song again, and this time I had the lyrics in front of me to figure out what it was actually talking about, it seems so much more sinister and so much more appropriate that maybe they had found, you have this cult that found an interspecial couple and was bringing them out into the middle of the forest and was literally going to burn them alive for their crimes against nature. And so that in and of itself is another form of a chaos cult and would drive a sort of, um, oh, what's the word I want here? Kind of a gothic horror kind of campaign. Um, I say gothic horror, and I just mean like everybody's in this strange cult. During the daytime, they all act normal, but at night, you have no clue who's a member of it. They're wearing these hoods. They're probably wearing masks or something. They come out of the night in full force without any warning at all, and you have no clue that they're going to come nothing that suggested this cult exists and they grab you and they bring you to this weird place and they're doing these strange rituals to these unknown gods and that's the kind of thing kind of cthulhu-esque i suppose so that was an idea i had um, another idea that i had was a sort of fairy tale ish world now there's two ways you can take that there's the modern take on fairy tales where they're happy fun time good stories for children and then there's the old school fairy tale where people die and get hurt and are really stupid. And it's a warning to children to not die and get hurt and be stupid. And um, given the Fallout Boy song, the second one seems more appropriate. So it would be a world that during the daytime seems all uh, happy and fine. But at night you have no idea what kind of terrors lurk in the darkness, including cults like the Animalists. Or whatever the heck they would call themselves. Uh, another idea that came up, and we will get to the picture eventually, is um, I found it on a blog. And it was the idea of a world where everything is a giant boss monster of some sort. It kind of went through a transformation. The very first idea was that you would be in this uh, area... You create a sandbox game. I know I've told you all about sandboxes. But every location that you're plotting on your sandbox map is actually like a dragon's lair. Now, there are other animals and other monsters and other beasts and what have you around, kind of guardian beasts uh, that the dragons have subdued and used to guard their lair. Or there might be these subservient like goblins that the goblin, ha uh, the goblin, you know, the dragon is dominated a goblin tribe and so they serve the dragon maybe worship the dragon as a god um, and of course you then you have the wild animals that would be in the area but for the most part everywhere that a player goes to kill things and get treasure is actually the lair of a dragon um, on this blog post someone had suggested a similar but slightly more uh, uh, an idea with more variety to it in that uh, it doesn't have to be a dragon, but it does have to be some sort of legendary creature. So you could have like a rock or you could have a giant or you could have a dragon or you could have, you know, all these other types of creatures, beholders. But basically every single location is the lair of some sort of strong boss monster kind of creature. 
And now that doesn't mean that once the players get there, they necessarily and immediately have to fight this boss monster. Um, but it does put a, the game in more of a thinking rather than fighting mode. Old school D&D was uh, you got your experience by getting treasure, not by killing monsters. Well, you did. I think the early, early, earliest edition, the very first edition, had no rules for experience for killing monsters, only for getting gold pieces. Um, and then they introduced experience for monsters, but you got more experience for the gold than you did for killing monsters. And over time, nowadays, 3rd edition, 4th edition, you get you're the vast share of your experience from killing monsters. 4th um, edition introduced the overcoming challenges, the skill challenges, story awards that are built into the system automatically from the beginning. 3rd edition had those things. 2nd edition had those things. 1st edition, I think, even had those things. Um, but the goal was in old school D&D, you got treasure. You didn't want to fight monsters. The, if you could get the treasure without fighting the monsters, all the better. And so by stocking all of the dungeons with these boss monsters, um, it makes the idea of get the treasure and get out even more important. And it puts the players on a slightly different footing about how they're going to interact with the game world. But that's an idea as well. Uh, to have Now you have these animals living in their kingdoms... And then what they are threatened by are literally dragons and giants and uh, and rocks and manticores and chimera and all these other big creatures um, that are powerful enough to hold sway over an area solely by themselves. And that would even explain why all the animals have kind of banded together and why you find them all mixed together in these communities. And it kind of establishes the um, t childlike, I'm going to say childlike because it's the, the ideas that I had of what a fantasy world looked like as a kid. You have the castle, you have the town, and then off over there somewhere there's a dragon and every once in a while the dragon comes to attack and the knights ride out to fight it and there's, you know, that's how the old, uh, <laughs> I say old school, that's how it, uh, the childish fantasy of uh, this medieval warfare goes. So that's the idea, um, and that's where I'm, I'm still trying to set in stone what I want to go for. Um, it's not a guarantee that I'll necessarily use the idea of the boss monsters. One of the other ideas I had is to move it into a slightly more renaissance feel, um, where... Oh, one last thing about the boss monster idea. Someone else suggested literally having only humans and then boss monsters. No other creatures, no animals, no goblins, no guardians, nothing. It's just, you're a human. You have your choice. You can go raid the giant's castle. You can go raid the dragon's cave. You can go raid the chimera up in the mountains. These are your choices. And there are no other th creatures to fight, just the big guys. So you better be pretty damn good about what you're going to do. All right, forgetting off that, one of the other ideas is to have a more renaissance kind of feel to it. Add a little bit more technology to the world, a little bit more culture to the world. Get out of the kind of medieval-ish era. Um, and it allows for a little bit more kind of uh, interaction, political intrigue, although you don't have to have that. Um, I think I guess what the, uh, the point would be is to get away from the idea of going out to the dungeon and fighting monsters. I don't think I mentioned this in the other video, but I do like the idea of these animal people not necessarily dungeon crawling for the most part. Everything should be kind of above ground, uh, maybe even just human versus, I say human, human versus human conflict. Imagine a D&D &D game where there's no monsters. Everything is one of the player character races and one of the player character classes. It's a weird game, um, given all the kinds of things you can do with D&D, &D, but it's, you know, it's there. It's a possibility. Um, getting into the fairy tale aspect as well, kind of like the happy during, you know, happy fun time during the day. That's kind of where this picture falls in. You have this floating island that's shaped like a whale. Also, doesn't wouldn't it suck to be the guy who lives in these towers? Especially as if you, I mean, you see this and you don't imagine that it just floats in the air static. You totally imagine it's flipping its fins up and down and moving its tail. Although if it moves its tail, it might break this, what looks like a Roman aqueduct, but is probably just a road. 
Maybe it doesn't move. Maybe it just floats. Maybe you can't see it. There's a string right here, and it's actually a giant's balloon. A giant child at the fair has his balloon. So is there anything else I can think of for the uh, the characters? Oh, and going with the Renaissance theme, that's also why I'm trying to move the Muri back towards a tinker kind of thing. Because there was a lot of inventiveness that went on during the Renaissance. And Pathfinder has a gunslinger class, and I certainly want there to be an availability of guns. Um, I do want those to exist. It's even possible to move it forward into more of a kind of Victorian era. And that certainly helps when it comes to the uh, Cthulhu-esque um, idea implementation, because when you, that's kind of the uh, the era that the regular Cthulhu mythos exists in, the Victorian era, and then into the twentieth century. So it's something to think about, um, but I don't want it to be that advanced. I don't want them driving around in cars or anything, or hopping a ride on the Zeppelin. I don't like Eberron with its with its uh, airships and airships occur so often, and yet I never really like them. I never like the implementation of them, and I certainly don't like Eberron's trains very much. Although, uh, and my my DM does because we had an adventure where we were solving a mystery on a train, and I just hated it to no end. But it's fun. This is my school. This is my fantasy. I love the old school, fan I say old school again, oh my gosh. I like kind of standard fantasy. I'm totally cool with a flying whale island with a castle on it. What else can I share about the world? You could go into an alternate culture. I could make it an Asian themed game. I could make it an Indian themed game, a Native American themed game. Native American as in South American up into Latin America. Oh, I could totally even do North American Indian tribes, African-themed game. Although then you want to vary the animals if you did one of the cultural ones. I do want there to be, um, like, I say feral, but sort of uncivilized tribes of barbarian animals. Um, if it's a more of a medieval game, then you would have, like, these druids that live out in the wilderness and aren't city folk like the normal people. I say city folk. My idea of the uh, rabbit folk is that a lot of them are farmers. Um, or if you have like a more colonial game. That was the, the era I was thinking of. Not, not Renaissance, not Victorian, but kind of colonial in the middle. Where there's not a lot of uh, resources. I mean, it goes back to the, the colonial idea for the sandbox game I mentioned in a video. But uh, just that era of technology, you have, you know, cert, uh, certain level of technology, but uh, you're not so far advanced. I mean, during the Revolutionary War, or well, before the Revolutionary War, Benjamin Franklin advocated to train the Minutemen with longbows. So despite the fact that guns existed, you know, there was definite use of bows as well. So that all fits together. Still have no idea. Um... As always, feel free to comment. And I still have... I've sat down a couple times to try and uh, knock out another race or so, but I haven't actually done it yet. I've had some homework that was uh, due, so I've been working on that. Oh, I will share another thing. Um, if I didn't... Men I think I mentioned it in one of the other videos that I was watching the, th the new Thundercats. And I've finished watching the new Thundercats series. And I just thought it was funny that they have essentially what I was doing with Animal Planet. They have all the different races. Now, they keep their races separate. Um, they each have their own kingdom, which is something I specifically didn't want to do. Although I do think the idea of having a homeland or kingdom for a couple of the races does make sense and would make sense. If not having, you know, areas that are just predominantly one race... Um, there will still be others, just like in normal D&D, you have the human countries and there's these other races and then you have like the elven country and you might still find the other races there too. Um, and then they had, they have the idea of cat people being like in charge. Like I had the idea of maybe there being a lion king and only cat people were the royal family. There is the idea of... 
um, working to unite the races together. The idea of all of the races being subservient to some greater evil power. If I mentioned, I think in the other video, other than the Lion King, maybe that there was a dragon that had subjugated all the races and then they had kind of broken free. That would be like Mumra. So there were a lot of ideas there, some that I kind of liked and some that I dropped. If you do watch like uh, the Lion the Lion King, if you watch the Thundercats, they have the cat people, the dog people, the lizard people. Um, there's monkey people, there's bird people. So they got most of the races that I was using anyway. And then randomly there's like uh, a random raccoon guy in one of the episodes. So they, they are ones where they've extended the races. And of course they have the Robert Burbles and they have the little plant creatures in the forest. The Bramblewood or whatever that was called. Lots of ideas. And I'm still working on how I wanted to do it. One of the things I mentioned in the last video, uh, the one that you don't get to see, was the idea of science fantasy, which is where Thundercats firmly lives and where a lot of uh, fantasy from the 1970s into the very early 1980s and probably from the late 1960s, I guess, um, you ended up with the science fantasy. So that's why the Thundercats, despite having spaceships and tanks and laser guns, fight using a sword and a quarterstaff and a whip and nunchucks. That's the science fantasy. That's why they can drive their thunder tank um, and launch missiles at the mutants. What is the name of that? It's the nose something. They have like these little vehicles and they drive nose first, so they're called nose something. Anyway, they can have this vehicular combat and then, you know, when the thunder tank breaks down, they can walk into the forest and find the unicorn keepers with their unicorn next to a babbling brook. Um, it's a weird mix of science and fantasy and it usually takes place far off in the future past an apocalypse where some technology still exists, but, you know, the, the rest of the world is kind of regressed to a more medieval level of technology. That could also work, but I don't want to go the science fantasy route with this game as of yet. Not until the idea of a badass rabbit with a, a laser rifle and a bandolier stops being so cool. Because <laughs> that just looks badass to me. I wish I had a picture of that. I did go looking for pictures of a couple of uh, things like that. I have, I don't have it here. Why don't I have it here? Oh, well, here's a shark pirate to make up for it. This guy's badass. He definitely needs to be able to be a character in Animal Planet. He definitely is a character in Animal Planet. I just decided that. His name is Captain Mako. Or whatever other kind of shark he is. Also, this doesn't look like it's coming out the middle of his back. It looks like it's coming... It looks like it's his shoulder blade. Just based on the framing of the picture. Or the perspective or the way he's standing. I don't know art terms. This video has gone on long enough. Um, if you have a preference for anything I've expressed, or if you have any other comments, feel free to leave them below. Until next time, bye-bye.